Well, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure to be here visiting Samantha, which she didn't say that she was my student two years ago. I'm old enough to have been her professor. And of course, I want to thank her for bringing me out, as well as Michael Fells and anyone else who is responsible for this. It's such a pleasure. Your campus is beautiful, and I've never been to the south before, and I'm completely enchanted. I've decided I need to come back in the summer. Um, it's really, it was just beautiful flying in, you know, and seeing the land and the kind of the tributaries and all of that. I've been pleasantly surprised and really moved by the landscape. And so yeah, I will start with just presenting my video because we loaded this earlier. Well, I'm telling you a little bit about why I made this video. I need my glasses. This is a new event in my life to need glasses. So um, I'm taking a chance. I, I might as well just start out with a, here I am, this kind of middle-aged woman showing you images about flowers. And I realized right away that that was dangerous territory. And I did it for a reason. And the story that kind of comes along with this is when I was in graduate school, I, I was in graduate school of four men. And I was the only female graduate student who was in attendance at that time. And of course, it was at the precipice of uh, digital photography back in the uh, late 90s. And everything was about technology. And we'd have these critiques. And you know, being the lone female who was taking all these feminist art criticism classes, and I would talk about the gays and all these other things, um, one day they said, just don't start making work about flowers. <laughs> and so I thought, OK, I will make work about flowers. So what I did is I went back and I did this performance with the next critique. And I actually ate this lily in front of these students. And it was been a kind of a long running joke with the people I went to grad school with. So recently I decided, you know, I'm just going to kind of take that and sort of look at that as a metaphor and a very powerful symbol. And of course, we all know that the flower is a very overused kind of cliche symbol, especially when it's aligned with um, feminine culture. But I'll talk about that in a minute. In terms of my work, I, 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 like, I like that term, eclectic creative, because I never really think of myself working alone. Um, you know, just as this kind of st studio artist, ex nihilo, out of nothing, this grand creator. I always imagine this kind of chorus of artists and literary figures behind me. And usually they're women, but not always. They're whispering in my ear, and, and I might suggest that I'm really influenced by people like Anne Hamilton and some of the titans of contemporary art. But more, more than that, I suppose I look to writers such as Virginia Woolf, Oscar Wilde, who's not a woman, but he deals with those sensibilities, uh, avant-garde filmmakers such as Maya Deren and others. But I've always had a great affection for the surrealist, that movement in particular, and the idea of magical realism, both in literature and art. And as Samantha mentioned, one of my undergrad degrees is in art history with an emph emphasis in Italian Renaissance. So I think I have this. Um, I also have an affection for that idea of order that you might see in a Renaissance painting, that very structured sort of way that things are ordered in that, within that frame, and the controlled disorder of the Baroque. I've been fortunate enough to have spent some time in Italy teaching a class years ago in Siena, so I would just be immersed in all of that kind of Renaissance art that I studied in school. And I do think that it's an underlying uh, sort of um, inspiration to my work. I'll play it again here. I don't usually do this, but. So you can see this kind of monstrous mouth. I might begin by speaking to the title that I've given this work, Write, Writhe. I know it's a bit of word play, and, and I'm not somebody who's very fond of puns. But this particular word play I found very interesting in the sense that uh, it's more in line with the idea of post-structuralist intertextuality, which um, that idea of the negotiation of the intersection and indefinitely expandable webs of text referring to other texts. And I might repeat that, but it's um, that idea of post-structural intertextuality, the negotiation of that intersecting and indefinitely expandable web of texts referring to other texts. I find that so interesting because it's the world we live in, and it's really probably what motivates my work, is that you know, you'll find something out there where it's a, a passage from Virginia Woolf, The Waves, and then you'll pull it over here, and I'll realize how this relates to this passage in Oscar Wilde, and this particular image I found from um, uh, Burne Jones from the Pre-Raphaelites, and bringing all of those things together and trying to give them a new context is something that I'm interested in in terms of my own work. So I wouldn't, again, call myself somebody who's always very invested in craft or working in the studio, but instead just bringing kind of all these disparate pieces together and creating a pastiche, very postmodern word. So I'll read a little bit so I don't kind of digress, which I'm always about, always doing when I start talking. Um, 
So I tend to work in a way where I engage in seeking these traces from culture and the natural world and set about creating an atlas or a compendium of my ideas, bringing materials together to create a new narrative um, that differs from the one of the individual parts. And I suppose artists always do this, but I think I'm very deliberate in that approach. It might be said that I'm engaged in good old-fashioned Derridian deconstruction, having to do with the philosopher uh, Jacques Derrida, who of course coined the phrase in the postmodern era. When you're, you know, I'm set on dismantling a particular way of seeing an object or image, of examining things or unraveling the effects of a wider and deeper history of language, the unconscious, of social institutions, and expected readings of those things. And I do this under a template of what might be called feminist considerations. I know that's a really tricky term these days. You know, I, I, I teach it in my classes, and everybody says, I don't want to be called a feminist. And I understand why that's kind of an easy ground. But nevertheless, my work has to do a lot with what's considered the stereotypical feminine in culture, whatever that means. And again, it's a cultural construct. Time is a cultural construct. Of course, we know that gender is as well. So those icons of femininity, those heavily loaded symbols, such as the flower, the ballerina, the butterfly, you know, those kind of things that are considered flowery, which is a dismissive term. And so I started pulling those symbols and sort of reenacting them to see where they kind of end up. And I realize that the word is not easily digested, as I just said, so let me rephrase that. I say I'm always speaking to the history of women and the cultural emblems of what might be considered feminine as a site. So I can go on now to my other slide. So I pulled this up because I found it's kind of a funny little slide, but it was, um, honestly, it's just a page in my notebook from years ago. And you know how you're jotting things down, and I always really uh, reinforce the idea that my students always have to keep a resource journal where you're, you know, writing down every quote that you come up with or, or you find or appropriate from culture. Because those things that later really are important to your practice is that you have these resource journals and you can go back to them and sometimes they inform your work in ways that you didn't expect. And so this particular line of thinking I wrote down about five years ago and it's not a particularly original or interesting, but the only reason why is that um, I'm intrigued by how language divides the world into this binary code. And it's interesting as well if you think about the word binary and how it applies to digital imagery and the ones and zeros. Um, but the, in terms of a binary, it's not an equal pairing of terms. There's always a hierarchy in implied by this binary. One term exists to reinforce the primacy of the other. And that's the only reason for its existence. So on the right, we have a list of ideas that are implicitly aligned with the idea of plentitude or presence in society. And other the column is simply that which is not presence, it is its lack. So you'll see here, you know, you can have it as like you've got form over matter, mind over body, culture over nature, self over other, stasis over fluidity, male over female, logos, which is the word, you know, the idea of reason and all of that, um, over delirium, light over shadow, right over right, which is why I came up with this title. You can go on and on with that. Uh, recently, I've been thinking about you know, the mater immaterial over uh, the material, because you've got transcendence over imminence. You could even apply this to analog and digital, where digital would be aligned on the, um, the left side, and analog has become this kind of body, this physical, this place of the ride, the materiality on the other side. And for me, as a visual person, I ask, you know, what would exist in that off-frame space? And I always give this assignment because I really, it's a hallucinatory, a hallucinatory uh, place that exists as a site, that off-frame outside of, you know, the viewfinder if you're a photographer, you know, what is not being included in that particular frame of reference, which is the photograph. And you can apply that as a metaphoric, metaphorical construct as well. So what exists there and how do I see it? Um, so I decided, you know, of course, and most theorists, post-structural theorists would agree with this, that it's desire, it is the gel, it's the lubricant between these two columns, these two pillars of the binary that keeps things in place, but it also allows for this movement between them. Uh, because desire is never attainable. That's what it's about. The very nature of it not being attainable, and it's because who we are, this kind of idea of desiring anything. It's not just sexual desire. It's just desiring to be alive. That life force is kind of the gel that exists between this structure that language has set up for us in society. And it prescribes how we think of the world, not just describes it. It prescribes it. The surrealist philosopher, again, with my affinity for the surrealist, George Bataille, speaks to how we seek equilibrium to escape our natural inclination toward delirium. So you've got order and chaos. 
And the other binary that could exist within these two would be Apollo and, and um, Dionysian. And of course, Nietzsche wrote The Birth of Tragedy, and he spoke about the Dionysian approach to art as opposed to Apollonian. And Apollonian's very um, in line with reason and order, and you've got Dionysus, right, the god of wine, you know, this kind of pagan impulse to disorder, the primordial, the body, as opposed to the mind. And so there's, um, women is often defined as a black hole hungry for words. So they're always aligned with this side of the body and delirium and shadow. And that's just how culture sort of places the feminine and that's where it resides. This, of course, is the basis of Cartesianism, and you all know this, I'm sure. You know, Rene Descartes, the Enlightenment philosopher who coined the phrase, I think, therefore I am, which really just set up this paradigm of thought where um, mind and body are mutually exhaustive, separated entities. Um, that's illustrated by that. By describing any particular language as a system of differences, meaning is not found in the words themselves but in the intervals, the contrast, the participation between the terms. That's a quote by David Abram. Between the black and white edges of the printed page or the frame, the garment gapes. Between the two edges, it is this flash which seduces, or rather the staging of an appearance as disappearance, is what Roland Bart it says in The Pleasure of the Text. For those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Roland Barthes, he wrote a very important um, article, well, essay, a book about um, photography called Camera Lucida, and it's kind of the Bible of people who um, sort of cut their teeth on that analog, the idea of the referent and what the, photograph, uh, the photograph is as a material entity. So he goes on to say, this intermittence exposes and hides. It is there, yet it is not there. We think we see it, but we do not. So it's that space between. So in thinking about this, all of these ideas that I just sort of uh, kind of put out there for your contemplation and write, write, one of the sculptures I studied, I had to write a paper on when I was an undergrad, was Bernini's um, St. Teresa, The Ecstasy of St. Teresa. And so, of course, I had to make that big pilgrimage. If you know Rome at all, you kind of got to go out of your way to go find it and actually see it in person. And it's up on a pedestal, and it's illuminated in the distance. And again, this idea of this wordplay, right, right, um, and how a single letter, the intrusion of a single character, a form in space, can alter meaning so dramatically. So if you think of the physicality of text and how you've got write and writhe, and you just insert an H, and suddenly you're on one side where it's all about logos and reason and the male paradigm, and then you're over here on writhe, which is the very most base kind of bodily thrust that you can describe outside of language. Uh, I said this earlier in my uh, statement is that the H is pronounced as the sound of a breath. It's a bodily emittance of air, uh, which is rendered silent in French. It changes the meaning of the word completely, and it's all about the body. So to write the word logos, language, the structure given to thought, and here you've got the letter H, two pillars held together by a horizon line. H for the hydrogen bomb, H for the sound of breath, rendered silent in French, the addition of a single character, again, transform the meaning of the word to its antithesis. To writhe conjures the somatic, the body existing in a fluid state outside of language. A body writhes on the extreme margins of the binary. Ecstasy, ecstasis, means outside of stasis. Uh, culture writes, nature writhes, desire is the horizon line. And so the, for, the frame, or metaphorical or literal, fails to contain the writhing beneath the word. So anyway, let's go back to the sculpture, which I found, you'll see why it uh, comes up in my work later on. Uh, I always was interested in this, you know, if you're familiar with St. Teresa, she was a Carmelite nun um, who's known in a mis as a mystic, and her writings speak of this bodily love of Christ, that you cannot love spiritually without your body in a carnal way. So this sculpture in her writings spoke to me. It breaks down the boundaries between things, between piety and desire, between spirit and body. Between these binaries is where desire is located. So you've got this kind of idea of lightness pinned down by weight. And you almost can look at it as sort of a butterfly pinned to a board. Because what's happening in this image, you've got St. Teresa who's in ecstasy with her spiritual love for God. And then she describes it in terms of this angel sort of piercing her with this hot golden spear, her words. And so it becomes very, very sexual. Um, it's actually Jacques Lacan, the, uh, the post-structural theorist, has used it as the emblematic image of female desire and orgasm. So it's become this other thing than when it was originally thought to be. It was all about this kind of spiritual uplifting, and now it's become very much about the carnal. 
So there's many different layers to this that I find interesting, but it was always kind of that point of intersection between the binaries. You've got the angel from the heavens. He's all about light, and he's piercing her with this pin. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a sword. It's a, it's a spear. It's this kind of intersecting um, material. And she's all writhing stone, and, and I found that really, really sort of, you know, intriguing about uh, how that kind of takes those two metaphors and, and fuses them, where it's the actual contact between heaven and earth and spirit and matter. I'm applying to those binaries again. In the essence, uh, the work is fluidity stilled, which is what a photogra you know, photograph is. So it was very photographic to me. Another aspect to my work that I'm always sort of trying to broach is how do you make work that's photographic without being a photograph? Uh, sometimes, you know, like, is there a sculptural artifact that is photographic in its discourse, but it's not actually an image on the wall? And I find that really intriguing because there's so much about it, you know, the fluidity and stasis, that containment of time and all of those other ideas that come along with photographic discourse where it doesn't have to be manifested in the image on the wall as a photograph. It could be something else. And I found this speaking to all those ideas that come up in photography in that same place. What did you say? I'm going to see. All right, the next one that comes up because it was Bernini was Apollo and Daphne. And Apollo and Daphne is uh, Bernini's other masterpiece. You know, he's a Baroque sculptor, so there's lots of this idea of this kind of, you know, this way the writhing stone is a good way to describe it, um, sort of embellishment and decoration. Of course, if you know the story of Apollo and Daphne, which I have an eloquent little chapter here that I'll tell you about. Um, Apollo and Daphne depicts the most dramatic and dynamic moment in one of Ovid the Roman poet, stories in his metamorphosis. And I just read that again this summer in Greece. Uh, it's, and it's a good read. I suggest that you pull it out because it's all these kind of changing body forms and it's incredibly metaphorical. In this story, Apollo, the god of light, schooled at Eros, the god of love, for playing with adult weapons. In retribution, Eros wounded Apollo with a golden arrow that induced him to fall madly in love at the sight of Daphne, a water nymph, so you've got this fluidity, sworn to perpetual virginity, who in addition had been struck by arrows with a lead arrow, this metaphor of weight, which caused her to harshly spurn Apollo's advances. The sculpture depicts the moment when Apollo finally captures Daphne, yet she has implored her father, the river god, to destroy her beauty and repel Apollo's advances by transforming her into a laurel tree. And this is some, I love that idea of the, the transformation, that moment of transformation. From the first sentence of his metamorphosis, Ovid makes it clear that he is not writing a traditional epic. He states outright that his intention is to create something new, writing, my mind carries me to speak of bodies changed into new forms. And that's kind of where the crux is for this, this particular sculpture for me. This little slides, I'm sorry. I pulled this off the web. It was so interesting because of what it says. It's, the fingers are like things in this metaphorical quality of art that reason can't grasp, and it's that translation again. A lot of times when you look for images on the web and you see things, there's been an intermediator, sort of a mediating device or a person interpreting it in another way, and I find that kind of interesting too. So it's kind of physically what I'm interested in, uh, just the way it looks. This is Tiepolo, it's a close-up of the painting. So there's been many, many manifestations of that kind of moment when she's transforming into something else. That kind of idea of flux again. I am so sorry. I found this and I had her name scrawled down. She's a New Mexico metal artist, and I thought this was just phenomenal as an interpretation of Apollo and Daphne as a jeweler and a metal person. But I will find her name. I had it written on my notes and I couldn't find it on the way over here, so that's not good. All right. So we'll go into what else I'm thinking about this idea of this translation between trans, you know, this idea of transformation. The feminist theorists, and I, I won't go into all that kind of heady detail that I'm always invested reading and not sure how to translate, but uh, the idea of transformation is where Aurea Garay, Lucy Garay, and Helene Sisu, who are both uh, known for this idea of um, feminine writing, uh, a creature feminine, where it's this idea that feminine writing is of the body and it's outside logos and, and different than uh, the paradigm of the patriarchal text. Uh, their, their discussion of writing, Irigay chooses words that are laden with images of fecundity, fruitfulness, multiplicity, sensation, and the body as they navigate the abstract terrain of philosophical discourse. 
Irigere writes of a symbolic terrain that attempts reconciliation and a healing that moves beyond entrenched dichotomies. The flush of the rose petals, sensation of the mucus regenerated somewhere between blood, sap, and the not yet of efflorescence. And the French feminist Helene Sisu uses the term jouissance to describe a form of women's pleasure or sexual rapture that combines mental, physical, and spiritual aspects of female experience, bordering on mystical communion. So we're back to St. Teresa. Zisu maintains that jouissance is the source of a woman's creative power, and the suppression of jouissance <laughs> prevents women from finding their own fully empowered voice. So jouissance is the fluidity between, again, other feminists have argued that Freudian hysteria, and I bring this up because it comes up later in my work, is jouissance distorted by patriarchal culture and claim that jouissance is a transcendent state that represents freedom from oppressive, oppressive linearities. So this image is kind of back to Apollo and Daphne, and I'm really sort of centered on this right now because it's the image of a, a woman from Hiroshima um, whose skin had been dermographed by the design of her kimono from the heat flash of the atom bomb. The dark areas drew more heat and severely burned her skin. She was violently mapped by these abstractions of her kimono. And you thus might say that she's been horribly photographed. So how I relate this to Apollo and Daphne is this kind of, you know, is it the excess of reason, the excess of light, um, marked her body and inscribed it. But we might ask the question as her body becomes a literal photogram uh, and relates to the inception of photography, of course, uh, is she burnt by the sun of rational thought for it was the excess, or what is it, the excess of reason or a state of delirium that led to the development of the bomb? And I, I must admit that I don't think I'm a particularly dark person, but I'm drawn to that roar beneath the stones, you know, that beauty. Beauty often has kind of a terrible underbelly, and that really is the definition of the sublime, right? You know, that idea of beauty is one thing, but when something's sublime, it takes you to a place of terror and something that you can't quite recognize. And so you've got this idea of femininity, you know, the kimono, but it's been horribly sort of transformed. This artist, I hope I don't massacre her name, is she? Ishiuchi Miyako, she's a Japanese artist, and I was going to ask somebody to help me. Ishiuchi, Ishiuchi, Miyako. It sounds, doesn't sound quite right, but chromogenic print of an A-bombed dress from Hiroshima, The Strings of Time, 2008. She did a series of large color photographs of A-bomb clothing from the Hiroshima Peace Memorial collection. Miyako only chose things that were once in contact with human skin. She photographs these ghostly things on a light table to illuminate the fabric stains and ruptures, holes and sutures. It is disturbing and oddly fulfilling to find so much beauty in the rendering of horror with spectacular aesthetics. Again, that idea of the sublime. Miyako writes, the objects that remained in the city after being subjected to a military and scientific experiment do not speak, they merely exist. But despite the horrors of the details, I found myself overwhelmed by the bright colors and textures of these high quality clothes. It is difficult for a human being to survive for even 100 years, but these objects have been bestowed with a longer existence. As parts of the largest scar the world has known, they will outlive us all and never grow old. And I'm really sorry I massacred her name because she's a well-known Japanese photographer. Uh, the illusion, this allusion to the photographist trace is another aspect of photography I'm very interested in. Uh, you know, it's this idea of the imprint, the death mask, all of those things that are applied to photographic discourse, a la Susan Sontag and Roland Barthes. It's, this story is po poetically linked to the Western culture, to the legend of the Corinthian woman who traced the figure of her lover on a wall before he departed for war. And this has evolved into the origin story of figurative art in later in the 1840s photography. I just, you know, the reason why I'm so passionate about photography as a medium, even though I do a lot of other things, is that it's that wonderful story. It's so romantic, right? It's this idea of alchemy and, uh, you know, the story of the Corinthian woman. It's full of those kind of legends that have, whether they're true or not, or necessarily uh, constructive in terms of the history or how we think of it, they're there and uh, they reside there as a way to kind of access it. So in terms of this idea of the icons of the feminine or the sentimental, I'm always trying to kind of 
create an uncanny uh, existence for these sentimental objects. So by twisting them, of course, the very definition of the uncanny is taking something very familiar and transforming it just enough so that it's subverted. It's not what you expect it to be. And I think that's one of my agendas, is this idea of kind of approaching the um, uncanny with that romantic sensibility, the ordinary twisted. I want to say this quote, but I put it down here. The photograph is violent, Roland Barthes again. Not because it shows violent things, but because on occasion it fills the sight by force, and because in it nothing can be refused or transformed. You know, we're confronted with a photograph. We're there. You know, we're, we have to see. We can't unsee what we've seen. And so there's a violent force to that. This was a piece I did in graduate school. It's just you know, a silver gelatin print. It's kind of a funny story because I'm going to get talk about the hysterics in a moment and crazy women, but uh, I had kind of a crazy woman moment in graduate school. I had a large format camera. I was taking all these very pristine negatives, and I was so proud of them. There wasn't any dust on them. I was printing them beautifully on this very expensive paper, and they just kept getting little hairs on them and dust and scratches, and I couldn't stand that they weren't perfect anymore, so I just sort of cut them up in little pieces one day. I was going to throw them away. And then later what happened was that, you know, I just sort of laid them between two pieces of glass, glass negative carrier, added other uh, photographs of other things with them, and created just sort of a sandwich negative. So this was my sort of rendition of uh, Apollo and Daphne, and, and just kind of, again, emblematic of my experience in grad school of always trying to kind of show that that idea of the feminine icon could be every bit as worthy as what um, I was being presented with. So again, I was looking, I started making these pieces because I was in grad school in the 90s, mid-90s. There was a moment in time when the abject in art was very, very much at the forefront. And the abject meaning, you know, dealing with things that weren't necessarily deemed representable by society. So there's a lot of work about the body, you know, Andre Serrano dealing with bodily fluids, you know, Piss Christ, the you know, really kind of iconic image from that era that had everything to do with the sort of critique of the NEA and Jesse Helms and all those sort of censorship trials in 1997. Um, but I was thinking about the photographic image because it was starting to change even then because digital was starting to be so prevalent and there was a lot of dialogue about how the materiality of the photograph had no purpose anymore. So I did create these kind of photo sculptures where I had these four by five silver negatives and I had cut them up and beeswax was a material that everybody was using too, a lot of encaustic painting. And so I would suspend these negatives in, after I melted some beeswax and turpentine to make a encaustic kind of solution. And then I would watch them sort of flow and wherever they sort of stopped would be my kind of idea of a photograph. So it was taking a photograph and reinterpreting it into another way that had to do with fluidity and stasis. So the, the act of the wax in the template that I had created, and when it finally kind of distilled, and those elements in place within that frame I created, the actual physical frame, was almost kind of a re-photographing, the act of re-photographing <laughs> in a different way. So this was part of my grad school work. I was also very interested in alchemy in a very primal way, like the idea of salt. So I kept thinking, like, what can I do with salt? And my professor, um, Paul Berger and, um, said, well, if you're really interested in this disintegration and this idea of fusing together kind of a religiosity or a spiritual sensibility with uh, science, then maybe you need to kind of attach it to kind of false scientific rigor to your practice. It, and I thought, what did he mean by that? And so I had these four by five negatives, you know, being that kind of traditional photographer where everything was very careful, and I had done a series of self-portraits which isn't very comfortable for me. I never like to be in a photograph. And I exposed them to a saline solution for a week. And what was interesting, I thought it was kind of a stupid thing, is kind of the stuff you do in grad school. You thought, okay, I'm gonna try this. He told me to apply false scientific rigor. Let's see where it goes. But the interesting about it was that every, because I have blonde hair and I'm sort of light skin and my eyes are light, the only thing that was left after a week was my mouth on the negative because my lips are darker than the rest of me. So it became interesting in a metaphorical way was that all that was left was my voice or my mouth. And so that became my work um, for my grad um, school, my MFA show, what's that called? And uh, so I also, in the wax I might mention, I haven't looked at this work for a while, is that I, there are bits of salt and they would crystallize. And with that I was referring to some of the earliest photograms when they would kind of adopt this 
which they thought was serious scientific rigor, to these photograms where they would crystallize salt on a glass plate and then do a, um, <laughs> did you laugh at that? They thought was, that was good, I know, thank <laughs> you. And they would sort of uh, crystallize salt on a plate and do photograms. I'm interested in the photogram process. I'm kind of subjecting my students to that, this term as we speak, that's what they're working on. And they all want to make scanograms and I'm not letting them, so we'll see what happens. Um, just another piece. You know, things fall, there's an ear in there. It's really, again, sort of my interpretation of that falling apart, the Ovid transformation of bodies, little bits of flora and fauna, and negative parts of bodies. This was my water book. You got to remember back in the 90s, Peter Greenaway, the filmmaker, if anybody knows who he is, was very, very popular, kind of overwrought, dramatic, you know, uh, films. And I was so influenced by Peter Greenaway. And so I made this series of water books kind of based on his work, and so they were long pieces. I mean, they were about, oh God, the one piece I did was about 12 feet long and just had a lot of, it was kind of a collage piece pressed between glass. There was negatives and these kind of four by five uh, small little contact prints that were subjected to the wax treatment again and pieces of books, and I actually destroyed these pieces, and I'm kind of sorry. I do that a lot. I make work and then I mess with it. I destroy it and try to make it into something else, which is, not that entirely uninteresting. So again, this was just the mouth and how things sort of ended up residing within the wax templates that I created for them. I did a piece because I was always kind of defying the preciousness of art, and I think I still tend to do that. Uh, I did a piece of these body parts that were supposed to mimic kind of relics, and there was this Catholic sensibility that went along with the much work that was done at that particular period of time. Andre Serrano again, Annette Messache, Kristen Boltanski, those people that I were looking at. And I put them up in an installation, uh, kind of like Milagros, and I invited them to be taken by various people. And I only have one left, so that's it. I just put this in because it showed up in my collection of just photographs when I started taking digital images. And I always tell my students that you can never get away from yourself. There's a certain sort of design sensibility or subject matter that you're always seeking. And I just took this photograph of an orchid, but it really looks like all my other work. You know, it's so present, my uh, particular way of looking at things. So I was gonna say a little bit about Maya Darren, just a little bit. Uh, she is an experimental avant-garde filmmaker considered a surrealist. The film that I'm most familiar with is called Meshes of the Afternoon. I actually just checked it out because I thought Meshes of the Afternoon, I mean, what a title, it's so beautiful. It had to be the most beautiful movie I would ever see. It's kind of hard to get through. I wanna love it because I love everything she's about, but yeah, if you've seen it, it's kinda of like, okay, I, do I really love this movie? But what I'm interested in is her, her relationship with this flower. And again, this idea of the flower metaphor and how women are traditionally uh, always aligned with the flower. And if you look at literature, there's so much that can be said. Uh, you know, Virginia Woolf is a writer that I'm very interested in. You know, she uses the flower metaphor repeatedly in the waves, and of course, Mrs. Dalloway gets the flowers, and Oscar Wilde then sort of co-ops that idea. And if you ever read Oscar Wilde, I mean, flowers, the picture of Dorian Gray, everything's compared to lilies. And Salome, the play, it is so beautiful because it's a mantra about beauty and sexuality and flowers. So I'm curious about this sort of, I'm just looking at these images. You know, she's seeking this flower. Um, you know, the flower metaphor, the blue flower was the idea of romanticism, people seeking the blue flower. It was used as a term for the romantic with a capital R. So I started just seeking out these images in culture, of, in film. This is kind of grainy, but it's a film still. If anybody's ever seen daisies, it's on Netflix. And it's another one that's hard to get through. It's a Czechoslovakian film that was made at the height of the Velvet Revolution when the Soviets marched into Prague. And it's these two women, they're called daisies, and they're involved in this madcap adventure. Um, and they're always kind of dressed in these floral costumes. And they eat all these cakes and they mess with older men. And if you read the, um, anything about it, any of the discourse that goes along with this film, you know, they are everything that was suspect politically. And so the females kind of represented this place of the delirium of what Europe was and what the Soviets were trying to control. It's another hard one to get through, but I'm telling you some of the imagery is to die for. You should just watch it to kind of glean out these particular little things. And this is, this is the subtitle, like we've gone bad, haven't we? But they keep doing bad things over and over again. And so again, that idea of the feminine aligned with this kind of sense of delirium and hysteria 
This is Krista Moss Klausch, and she's just kind of a cult figure on the web right now. Most of my, a lot of my students just sort of introduced her to me. She, I think she thinks of herself more as a fashion phot photographer, but I find it fairly interesting in this kind of floral motif and what she's doing, and just people that I've been looking at. This just showed up. Let's go through a few. I feel like doing a huge atlas of this. Also, this idea of uh, the feminine being aligned with flowers is a way to oppress women. There's a lot of um, writings about Victorian society and how women were thought of as flowers because they're supposed to be delicate and ornamental and something that could be cultivated. But also, in terms of the sciences, often women were allowed to be botanists in the 19th century. It was a place that they could excel, they could arrange flowers, they could grow flowers, they were a flower. So in that case, they could actually um, end up being involved in botany. But they were still, you know, of course, kept on the periphery. Hannah Hawk is this, another surrealist Dada artist who did a lot of photo montages, the famous body of work called Cut with the Kitchen Knife. Uh, Sort of idea of um, altering, creating new body forms out of disparate materials. And so she did an album, which is coming in the, I just ordered it online, I was interested in it, where she created an atlas of all these images that she found in the world that she thought were interesting, and she put them together in a book. And there's cats, and there's babies, and there's flowers, and I thought that was kind of interesting because it's something my mom might have done, and it's Hannah Hawk, who's considered a pretty important Dada artist. This idea of transformation again and, and uh, the uncanny, transforming something enough that it's, it's recognizable, but it's a new form. This is her Indian dancer image, and this is probably the most important image that I've always looked at in terms of my own work because there's a sense of entrapment. She does remind me of uh, patients in a mental hospital. There's something that's you know kind of veering on a little bit horrifying with these. I'm just gonna go through a couple of these. And Elizabethan uh, collars became kind of a floral motif. And if you know the history of the Elizabethan collar, it was meant to, again, sort of reinforce Rene, Guitar, Rene, Guitar, um, Rene Descartes' uh, idea that the mind is separated from the body. And so to kind of reinforce that sort of separation, that dichotomy. And this is one of my pieces. And this isn't work I show very often, but I'm feeling kind of brave that I bring this out. I made a body of work that was really just meant to be, give to my friends. They were just photographs of myself performing as these different sort of flower archetypes. And I never thought I would show them, but a couple of them were better than others, and they've been in a few shows. Uh, this one in particular was created right after 9-11. Um, I was actually in the air on 9-11, and our flight was diverted to Bermuda. And I came back and taught an advanced class right after that. And it was that question of how could you make anything about beauty in a world where there was such horror? You know, we were really dealing with the, the after effects of that. And so what we decided to do was create a um, portfolio together, a group portfolio that we would donate to the HIV Alliance and then they would sell it. And they sold it for $350. We just felt like if we were going to make art, it had to be for something that was outside of ourselves. And we all did a self-portrait, some guys of a self-portrait, and this was my Manifestation of that. If you know anything about photography, though, before digital, I had a, there was actually a bench behind there. I'm sitting on a bench. So I burned in 24 of those prints, <laughs> which isn't always that easy to get rid of that, that bench. But they were built, you know, kind of based on this idea of you know, different archetypes, Demeter, you know, the wheat woman. Uh, this was just, you know, this idea, this flower. And I bring this in because I'm thinking about doing something kind of performative, and this is coming to play. They became a little bit more horrific because, again, I, Victorian sensibility, the mask and the kind of shrouded sort of sensibility of her being in this gothic space. You know, I probably do have a little bit of a gothic thing going on. But I wanted them to be, you know, taking that flower metaphor and to have some sort of pathos of that kind of a hopelessness, but yet beauty. And I actually just glued a bunch of lilies on my face and stuck one in my mouth and said, take the picture to my husband. <laughs> he did, so they're a uh, large format, uh, two and a quarter, uh, rather two and a quarter negatives. So this kind of goes into some other work that I did. Apollo and Daphne again. This is a representation of how the, the hysterics, the turn of the century, there was a, um, an interest in chronicling the behavior and the, the gestures of the, what was called the, the hysterics. 
uh, the most famous hospital being Saltpetriere in France and Paris. Dr. Charcot is the famous doctor who invented it. Um, these women were uh, photographed in various guises of Baroque and Mannerist painting, and there was the theater of hysteria. So the women would be asked to perform for these male doctors, these different maladies, which would be hysteria or melancholia, um, nymphomania, that kind of thing. And they called them the attitude passionels, the passionate attitudes. And of course, they direct, they're directly related to, I think, Bernie's sculpture of St. Teresa in ecstasy. There's even the same sort of sensibility. But these kind of writhing bodies, these contortions that the female body would do, kind of wrapped in these white gowns, was somehow very interesting to me. And I um, started imagining them as being these giant caterpillars or something. And, those contortions, looking up to the heavens, like St. Teresa. So really what occurred in the 19th century is that that kind of mysticism that existed in terms of what, how St. Teresa was defined became the body of the hysteric. Oh, really? Am I going too far? Oh, seriously? OK, no, God, that's interesting. I didn't even know that I'm going too far. I thought I wouldn't have enough to say. OK, let's go back to this. This is my work. This, um, that's really funny. OK, let's keep going. Um, Augustine is a theater of archetypes, the photographer's executioner. This is the work that I did that was affectionately called the brain tissue ladies. And I'll probably I saw that much more. And so I'll just tell the story, kind of backtrack in terms of how I found these. I was in Seattle in grad school, and I went to this flea market, this crazy place in Fremont where they had this missile in front. And there was this kind of dusty boxes that you could rifle through. And in the back was a box that was labeled uh, clean electrodes, brain tissue samples from Bellevue Hospital in 1935. And since my work was dealing with this idea of the hysterics, it was really weird that I found this box. And I remember I went to purchase it, and he says, I didn't even know I had these. And he's, you know, he kind of was making jokes about, oh, this is the mass murder and that kind of thing. It was really kind of macabre and sort of terrible. And so I purchased these, this box of brain tissue samples that later I found indeed they are pieces of brain tissue from Bellevue Hospital in the 1930s. But the speculation was, of course, amongst my colleagues and myself, was that perhaps there was like pieces of lobotomized patients' brains. And that was huge to me at the time because I was dealing with this idea, this construct of patriarchy and the idea of hysteria. So what I did with them in graduate school, I ended up projecting them really large. And that was a whole different piece that I want to talk about, obviously, because I don't have time. But um, I ended up kind of having a Dada moment where I cut them up and I created these little hats. And I placed them over carte de visites, which are a photographic calling card, which are incredibly sentimental. And they're a different kind of way of approaching photography. And I created these little characters. The watched glass is there to sort of emulate the idea of a lens. So they teeter on the threshold between science and sentiment. They're very absurd. They're very tragic. But they also sort of uh, speak to the idea that neither one of these uh, processes of empiricism can really speak to the mutability of a human life. So it's that space between again. And so there were several. There were 12. They were painted uh, white lacquer boards, 12 by 12. And they were only women and children, because in society, women and children are considered the most mutable human beings, most malleable. And so there were no men. Some of them were crowns. I'll go through them really quickly. And this is the work I've had the most <laughs> success with. I don't know if it's just kind of the, the shock factor or what. But they, um, and then there was a series having to do with this demented ballerina, so I'll, <laughs> I can't even talk about this very well now. But again, a female uh, icon, and she was sort of broken. And it, her the title was La La, which had to do, of course, with uh, law being the feminine in French, and also um, the idea of la la la, you're kind of crazy or you're silly. So the, there was a little voice recorder inside of them that said la la la, and they could repeatedly hit their head. And everybody's looking at me going, oh my god, you guys are, she's a really crazy person. But and then I took a video of it, having to do with crazy women. And these are the photographs. And then these pieces are in the show. Again, just the writhing body in white silk that kind of mimics the rest of what I'm talking about. And I meant this work to be somewhat uncanny in the sense that, you know, as a hospital gown, there's like always a seam showing. They're kind of awkward. Are they sexual or are they sort of sad? Um, they were meant to be just sort of oblique that way in terms of. You know, there's a snap. It's kind of open in the middle. I'm kind of, again, always kind of accessing that. Uh, and I won't even talk about the moths because that's another part. But that's in the, in the show. I'm so sorry I took so long. And if you go to my show, there's the um, flower eating video, 
and these are some of the stills. I took the stills to sort of extract from the video itself and to kind of make the point of the, again, that sort of inability to extract that experience through this, this through stasis. And I just will read you one quote that goes that kind of finishes everything, I think, um, in an interesting way. It's Antonin Artaud, who is a surrealist writer. Uh, who am I? Where do I come from? I am Antonin Artaud, and if I say it as I know how to say it, immediately you will see my present body fly into pieces, and under 10,000 notorious aspects, a new body will be assembled in which you will never again be able to forget me. Thank you.